בוקר טוב, צהריים טוב, שמי יואב מברטר, אני לא מתפרסם most of this thing in English, so forgive me for that one, for those that are not comfortable with English, but after 30 years in the United States, it's easier to converse. And now we'll cover actually the state of the financial technology, the fintech industry, give you a little bit of a background where we are with some of our challenges. And uh, then I will uh, lead with uh, a little bit of introductory to uh, blockchain. Uh, my colleagues actually will present after that one uh, how you codify contracts with blockchain. Uh, interesting if you, you pay attention to the latest, greatest news, uh, some of the uh, fraud uh, that uh, happened recently. Uh, we can actually even maybe discuss it uh, later in terms of uh, the conversation. Uh, the other two sessions on the cyber, uh, unfortunately, are one of them literally got sick only in the morning uh, with the stomach flu. I said, okay, stay at home, uh, save the train. Uh, the other one, actually, I got a notice that a uh, few days ago that they might appear or not appear because they have some uh, major VC coming, and eventually the VC is over here. So forgive me with that one. So the two sessions that you will see here, it's my session and my team <laughs> regarding the blockchain technology. That one. Uh, so let's start a little bit on um, what some of the challenges that the financial industry is actually uh, facing. And I'll take it actually um, in the reality that almost any, every aspect of the financial industry that we used to know is already reimagined. So all the way from money to wallet to branch to service, everything that we actually can think of is being reimagined. A really ama amazing transformation that this entire industry is actually going, and all of this actually happening at the same time also to the technology. So all of the things that we actually knew as a technology actually transforming, you know, you, sorry, you look very familiar. Uh, sorry, uh, somebody from the service one all day, so wow, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, uh, Almost all of the technology that uh, we, used, we, we used to think as an infrastructure is actually also changing our, under our feet. So you have two, two aspects. One is the business is changing, right? the business model, and really all of the enabling technology behind us is actually also changing. Uh, so if we talk about you know, infrastructure, to the infrastructure we talk about the cloud, right? So it's a very different. And to all of this transformation that we actually were talking about, primarily, emerged because of two things. Suddenly, memory is unbounded, storage is unbounded, right? You can do things that you never actually dreamt. And, and most of us are, some of us with the gray hair, still remember that we are programming concept always. We're trying to worry how much memory we can conserve, right? And how much we conserve, not actually how much we, we utilize. Today, nobody actually will even think as a constraint to have a mem memory constraint behind it. So everything is transforming. And, and even we, we can even look ahead in terms of what the future, will for example, quantum computers, uh, cryptography is actually will be, uh, will make some of the cybersecurity even obsolete in that context. <coughs> so there is a sort of, everything is an emotion in a very short period, uh, everything needs to basically to change. So the question for us, uh, and I would dare to say for all of the banking is, it's not if we have to change, that, that's given. We will have, we will we recognize that the bank of the future will be very different than the bank of today. And, and we recognize it. So the question is what the, the future banking look like? Uh, so maybe there is no branches, but uh, we believe there will be still a value proposition that the banks actually can introduce uh, into their customers. So if we look at that one for a second, here's just very few samples if I take my R portals and I lay, lay over the fintechs, the potential fintechs, that's literally almost every function I can find you few instances of a fintech that cover all of the functions we have. So somebody would say, okay, so how do you deal with, and why it's sort of like we have seen all of those coverage, all of those fantastic, why the fintech industry still haven't really emerged in a big time uh, beyond what it does today, right? We, we, yeah, there's some successes, but there are few. And, but we haven't, as a bank of Berlin, we are 
the reality, we still see growth. <laughs> we still grow with ourselves, there's still some growth. Some of the growth that I see in the FinTech is taking a market share that we haven't even targeted. But in reality, if I just look at this picture, I think that reminds me another challenge that we used to face a long time ago. And I'm going back to the old days where uh, we in the bank, we found ourselves suddenly with silos of solutions, right? And each one of them had different look and feel, different organization, nothing connect with anything. This is almost exactly the same thing, if you think about it. Those are point solution that none of them almost integrated with the others. So it's really like a very limited silo. So who wants a point solution, right, in this kind of a model where you really want something unified, right? So I think here's the opportunity for the bank is really the integrator of a lot of those FinTech solutions that actually you see here. So we don't necessarily see them anymore as a competition. We see it as an opportunity to, to leverage those technology. And the last year actually there's some, another phenomenon actually happened. A year ago, two years ago, I would hear the fintech industry is about to disrupt the financial industry. The young companies that will emerge, their mentality, I'm going to disrupt this industry. I'm going to really beat you down. Today, the mentality is very different. They come to us, let's partner. So from be disruptive to let's partner, it's a very different model now. So here's the new opportunity, and we see it as a definitely as a new opportunity. And, and some of this realization from the fintech, because the market is also changing. We start seeing the land three other company getting down. I mean, there's big companies falling down, collapsing. They almost facing a new reality, right? And that's become, I think, realization on both sides that there's really an opportunity, and the opportunity is around collaboration and integration of the solution. Here is just a few examples of and, you know, uh, alternative lending, uh, cash station reward, empowerment, peer-to-peer uh, -peer transaction, all of those in the, in the market is really very noisy, right? And, and guess what? I, every year, in the last year, I met more than a 300 fintech companies just in Israel, right? Over 300, sometimes, so it's almost a, a company a day, right? And, and, and it's like, if you think, when do you work, right? When you spend the time actually doing any work, right? When you have actually, you have flooded of, uh, of so many companies, of so many fintechs uh, flooding you. Historically, we used to think about, okay, we really want to get something cheaper, better, and faster, right? Uh, is that enough, right? And we actually recognize that the element of destructiveness is really if you can address at least two of those aspects. One is really not enough, so really to be considered destructive, you really have to address it, the minimum two. And then there's another question, is that enough? Okay. Uh, is safer is maybe is a missing over here, which not necessarily has to do with the broker. But again, that, that's something that you have to argue. Here is an interesting uh, picture. And uh, we at the bank, really you have to ask yourself, what's the bank for our customer? And who is really our customer? So this is a true reality. My mom is actually, we have to update, she's actually at the birthday. She's 92 years old. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah. I hope everything will, she will hit the 120 and above. And you can do it actually almost today, right, with the technology. And 92 years old, and she goes to the bank, <coughs> literally, to have a good chat. For her, the bank is a social event, you know? And I don't think the bank really, I mean, she doesn't need to go almost every day to the bank, but she does. That's the bank. For her, the bank is a physical entity, this branch. When I look at myself, I'm very schizophrenic in terms of the bank. My bank is my mobile, my bank is the, no, my laptop, my bank is the physical, I'm, sometimes I'm like, like, wh where should I go? Which, which channel actually I'm interacting? And then there is my, 20, it's a mistake of a 26 year old daughter that actually is a new immigrant from Israel. She is a, a student PhD student in Haifa. And she called me literally a few weeks ago and she asked me, Daddy, how do I deposit cash money? And I was like, oh my God, my, she's 26 years old. She doesn't know how to, to deposit cash money. She never had to, okay? She came in the United States and whatever it is never really earned cash money. And now she's holding the thing and she doesn't know what to do with it. And, 
And I was like, start wondering, and wow, this is amazing. And her, really, the only interaction was in the, with the mobile. My, my virtual grandchild, uh, that hopefully will come one day, I don't know what the bank will be for her or for him. Right? Well, what is the mechanism that the interaction will be? What flavor it will be? So what we actually see in this time scale is actually moving, shifting, obviously, to the left side fairly rapidly. And we as an event have, by regulatories, and some of you were wondering why we're not doing rush, things like that, because we, we really have to cover this entire spectrum. We cannot say to my mom, mom, we really appreciate it, but we don't have the time, and we really, you know, don't come to the brunch today. Okay, we can't tell those kind of things, especially me, I will not ever tell her that one. So here, this is really a significant challenge. So we see this kind of an evolution. What we also see that the behavior of the new generation is very different. And let's face it, most of us don't even can comprehend it. I'm looking at most of you. I mean, I see my daughter, the young one, or the older one, texting to her friend that's standing beside her. Now, you would say it's irrational. Why don't I just turn to her and I talk to her? Why do I have to text to her, right? So there's a behavior that really we cannot comprehend. So in essence, one of the realizations we have in the bank, in the past we used to say, let's build it for them, right? The word for them. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Well, we don't understand them. How are you building for them? Why well, you build it for them? You barely can analyze what actually their behavior, and you always you, you apply your own logic and your behavior, your past, your own experience, everything. So build it with them, lift the for them, right? So it's a very different model that now we're getting into. How do I build a solution with a generation that have a very different behavior, they're really evolving, and definitely the mobile is really, we can see how, how many times they actually appear and interact with each other, and this is already an old slide. Right? So this is some of the really challenges. What we also recognize that the experience is really critical over here. We all of the bank have the same ketchup. Let's face it. We all have the same ketchup. We all give loans, you know, we, we all have the accounts, we all have training, we have everything the same, all or less the same. How different we are. So really, we need to realize that it's all about the experience. And this is what this, this new generation actually teaching us. They need this unique experience that fits them. And some of the solution that you get and you get with your experience should be really different. Because your profile is very different. Your profile is very different. Your need is very different. And we need somehow to figure out technically, which is really a challenge because we haven't really thought about those in the past in the same way because we build a uniform platform to everyone, suddenly it needs to be very different to each one of you. So now we have to do a segment almost of one, right? Think about it, just every one of you getting to, to your account and getting a different experience. That's the, the reality that actually we actually have to face, right? And really f figure out how to address it. And this experience obviously different if you're traveling, so you have to squeeze it, or you, if you dip it, or whatever, right? So I hope I don't have to explain experience. If you, if somebody has to explain it, it's already mute, right? And critical. So we are moving in a world that the UX is so is, is a fundamental element in our service and our solution and how we're actually delivering it. <coughs> but more than that one, I mean, all of this to do that one, what really drives it is data. Right, is the data of, of that whatever we can get from any chance. So now it's like it's not enough what you have. You're actually going outside to try to understand who is this guy, who is this lady, what are they doing, where they are. So we have to build this kind of a mechanism for this cult to this environment. So when we see this this bank, we know we talked about branches, and here, you know what? In my opinion, very closely, I and mean, we still. Servicing a segment, a very small one, is shrinking that probably in the past law were not necessarily in this branch. And maybe you want some human. So now we have the concept of a digital branch, right? Digital branch? Isn't oxymoron? Digital branch. Well, wow. Yeah. Well, why, why have a digital branch? So if you think about it for a second, 
And I remember that very well, this picture, I wish I had it, I uh, forgot actually to include it, of United Airlines. I used to travel quite a lot. I used to do uh, run a practice in the United States. And this is the period when the ATM of the checking became very popular, start getting into the market. Mm -hmm. And I remember this picture. You go to the terminal, and you see line of picky people standing for to check in. And then there's a wall on the side that's standing like zillions of ATM and nobody actually touching them. It was almost a year, this situation. Why? Because if you as a customer, you used to use the line and say, well, wait a minute, should I go over there? No, 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 it's like if I go over there, I, I get in trouble, I missed my line, right? <laughs> so I'm staying in the line. It took a year for the travel industry to realize that they can take some of the people in the account from the, the, the stewardess, right? Or the steward to get out of line to show people how actually to use those ATMs, right? And suddenly, over time, it's actually shifted. This is exactly what the digital branch is all about, is help to people actually, we don't want them to come again to the branch to enjoy the the beautiful digital experience. That's not the intent, if this is somebody was thinking. Far from that one. We want them actually to teach them the ability to get the experience, get the confidence in this new technology, and hopefully you won't come back ne next time. You'll figure out how to do that one. If you come next time, you probably fail. We fail. Right? So that's the mentality behind the digital branch in the back of the world, but it is, there's a potentially behind that one. Because we are in a period of really transitioning, right? Transitioning from one model to a very different model that it's actually very, very digital. So enough said about data in terms of the growth, but how do I actually take this data and actually make it useful and meaningful to you? And clearly, thanks God, there is now a machine learning. There's predictive analytics. There's all those model analytical models that now I can really understand better you, hopefully, versus you, hopefully. So I have those models actually now built in that actually we can actually service each one in a very different way. <coughs> at least a capable technology uh, at that point, but we're still not there. So the UX become a much more factor. Software still will be there, uh, the primary driver. But infrastructure, you see infrastructure? And people tell me about the infrastructure, I don't care about the infrastructure. We don't want. The only thing I have to care about infrastructure because the regulatory forces me to still address infrastructure. I always have this concept of zero infrastructure. Nothing, nada. Uh, we don't need that one. I mean, we don't want, we, our core business is actually financial. It's not in maintaining hardware uh, or, or system. So how do we get in that one? And uh, we obviously will take a time until we get to that point. <coughs> so what's really the vision? The vision is eventually we want to think that the bank will transform to a financial advisor. We want to be the preferred financial advisor of the customer. And we truly believe that in order to be this financial trusted advisor, there's a lot of changes that we actually have to go. So it's not just changing our system, it's changing our mentality in terms of recognizing that there is a competition. We have to compete. We have to basically, in some respect, if I have to give you a suggestion around loan and the, your, my competition is a better, I should actually trust forward you and point to, to my competition. To get to that level, imagine the trans transformation that the industry needs to go, or our bank needs to go. Not a simple one, and I can tell you that one. It's not a simple one. We all recognize we have to get there. We don't even actually have a choice, okay? So what is some of the things, what it really means? We have to be much more transparent, much more open. We need to aggregate data from all of the sources, hopefully with, with the with approval of the customers and so on. So here's a, a little bit of interesting. If I look at pre-2004, and you just laid some of this technology, this is the way we used to think about the very proposition behind those technologies, right? Because we didn't really look at the meaning of the data. What is the value of the data, okay? And the, within two years, we suddenly got a very, suddenly realized that a lot of those things that actually were sitting over here suddenly shifting and going up and maturing, like blockchain, right? Bitcoin, we, nobody actually wanted even to spell the word Bitcoin, 
right? Go, go. I mean, don't go over there, right? We don't want even to know what it is, right? We heard that there's the silk and all this other stuff. So suddenly there's a different realization that we really need to look at the things in a very different way to the way we actually look at them today. <coughs> IoT, uh, I will tell you in that respect, uh, is really far from yet to be applicable for the industry, but we are looking at it. Some of my team members over here and I have a laboratory, and we all, when we actually experiment in all the new stuff, FinTech or no FinTech, just to try to find out how those technology are, can be utilized in our industry. Uh, because we don't know where it will come. And that's the point. Assuming that you know, <coughs> if you assume you know, you're already by, but it fault immediately. So we basically would say, we know, we, we, we don't know, we will have to learn over the time. The same thing, we recognize that, what is ATM? ATM is a robot. People actually say, oh my god, the robotic. ATM is a robot, I'm sorry, it's a dumb robot. But so now we're moving to a different generation of robotics, right? And what we call it the virtual customer assistant advisory. We call it the VCA square, right? And what is it? It's basically introduce some robotic. Today this technology with NLP, with machine learning, with predictive analytics, all this great stuff, topology, <coughs> graph uh, databases. We literally, the technology is there today to, to have almost a normal conversation between machine and person, right? And, and we really, people say, yeah, it, it, it's the same thing as the revolutionary industry that actually had. It is scary to some, but we recognize we don't have any choice. We really end up, will have less and less commodities type of solution. And you know, how many times the, our people, uh, the banker have to answer, how do you reset your passport? I'm gonna say that should be already Hope you know of me. Yes, it's me. <coughs> Sorry, that one. So, we do recognize that this industry going to this direction where we actually will have to service our customer in a much more efficient way if we really want to personalize it, <coughs> right? And it will eventually we'll have to less of those type of services that are commodity-based services to more expertise, right? You, you need to be the expert banker to actually to try to help him. And over the time, this expert, there will be less expert, but you'll have other expertise also emerging. So we have to basically to move up in the supply chain, as we're actually talking about. And now, I'm just, this is, so I, I, I'll show you an example of technology that some of you might say, wow, that's stretched. I have made it reality, okay? So here's a bank, uh, uh, Commonwealth of in Australia, Common Bank of Australia. And now you can actually can take your phone and you can view neighborhood. And as you actually look in the houses, you see the price of the house, mortgages, can you afford it, don't afford it, you know? This is exactly what it is. This is an, something that looks like a very stretch now becomes very reality. And I, we're truly now experimenting with some of this technology with this augmented reality because we believe that again, the human factors, we need to, we're constantly searching for different capability, new factor, how to make things basically very simple, up to in your fingers, where you are, when you need them, and not basically <laughs> sort of like, let me call the, my mortgage company and find out this house in uh, Sycamore Street uh, what really, <laughs> the, the cost of this house, what's the mortgage for that one, and what's the utility bill, and so on and so on, right? Doesn't make sense anymore. I can actually point this thing on a car, I can see the price of the car, because I can recognize it. Chancellor can recognize the music, and then Chancellor will actually recognize entities, different entities, you can get different value proposition. So the human factors actually are changing also, and we actually will have to really build capability around those. Now, one thing that I always say when I joined the bank, I, I, I noticed there's sort of a rush around the gimmicky stuff, right? Like Apple Watch, Google, uh, Google Watch, God knows what watches anymore, that's actually really, like it's as if they will are really disruptive. First, they're not really disruptive. We haven't seen any major customer acquisition because of somebody has some Apple Watch. 
But what we didn't realize in the past, that this is just the way, the new way of doing business, so we just need to recognize it. It's like it doesn't matter if we do it five minutes later or after, we all will do, we all will have those, those technology, but really you have to focus on where is the very biggest value proposition, where is the business model, not where is the next gadget. And then this is something that the, the industry is actually, I think, now uh, more uh, recognizing. So every time we're, we're, we're looking at the industry, I'm asking, is it another gimmick? Is it just another front end? Or is it really something transformative? What's really the changing the business model that actually comes to me? And that's a question that we will have to address uh, over the time. Uh, I, will, I will give you a little bit of introductory, and my team will, will conclude that one regarding the blockchain. So I don't know how many of you just to know where we're standing in terms of knows about enough about or feel comfortable about blockchain. Okay, uh, so I, I'll do a little bit of a uh, very quick because it's uh, <coughs> it's not a, a, a presentation that focuses on that one, but I'll give you some uh, of the flavor. So blockchain is basically a ledger. Some of you can think about database. Okay, and and. Traditionally, we actually we have a centralized ledger, right? And in reality, um, all of the things basically in your line, we can fix our own ledger, right? Because it's, we have ownership of that ledger, we can do whatever it needs to, but that used to be our ledger. And what we're actually talking about is distributed ledger, right? It's distributed ledger that the database that you're always seeing a replica of the same database appearing in multiple nodes. Okay? So you have a copy over here, copy over here, copy over here, and they're all the same. Now, one of the challenges when explaining uh, blockchain is, and I, I just came from a, a conference about the future of money. And I had to explain to economists the blockchain. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have this slide because it's uh, actually funny. And I, Show them, I started by showing them a very high-tech hammer that I actually found out. Hammer is amazing. I mean, uh, when I saw it, I was like, wow, look at this, the, the, the spec. Can, uh, using kinetic energy, very lightweight, uh, using this kind of material. Good. I was like, wow, what an amazing hammer. As a gadget collector, I wanted five of them. Why? I don't know why I wanted five, but you know, it's like I, I'm thinking like in a service. Yeah, think about it. How many uh, Baltanim you can actually hammer with that one, right? I was just thinking about all of this, this capability. I want, I want this hammer, right? So then I start searching. Where's this hammer? When you get it? Because I saw the picture of that one. And guess what? I fell into a website of a game. as a virtual game. And this kind of a monster that actually carried this, this hammer. So the question that I used that one, is it sort of an analogy that we just find a great hammer and we're trying to find a nail? Let's face it, that's exactly what happened. We find an amazing hammer that really was to service the Bitcoin in the past, right? And suddenly we realize, wow, there are such great properties that this hammer have that maybe we can use it also to other things. And the question is, is it real or not real? And then finally, as we're actually moving along, we recognize this hammer really has a, a really amazing properties. It really can be disruptive. So the cheaper, better, and faster definitely satisfy those kind of these two or three of the characters, they definitely satisfy, right? So we move from here, so now we recognize, so this is still okay, and what can I do with the distributed ledger? And the first thing is peer-to-peer, right? Now I can have an a interaction between any one of those nodes interesting characteristic. So let's look at what this ledger, when I look at it, what it looks just uh, conceptually. So the, you see over there a block of data, of each block is a record, and those records are actually chained. Now, again, one of my biggest challenges to explain blockchain, because blockchain is based on a map. And there's really no analogy, good analogy in the real world that says, this is what is equivalent. I have a digital wallet, I have a physical wallet, I know what it is. So we all dancing what we're trying to actually to explain. And actually I showed some very funny analogies that people use right to describe it. And one analogy is a piano falls, 
in some street and eventually there's hundreds of people actually seeing it and then you tie a, a polygraph to each of them and you ask them, have you seen a piano falls? Right? Street. This is the analogy that actually somebody came to. Why this analogy? An analogy is actually saying because you're unlikely to try to convince more than 50% of the audience that actually saw the piano fall that the piano, they haven't seen the piano. No piano fell. So suddenly you have to be so rushed so quickly, right, to try to convince all of the more than 50% of the audience that <coughs> nothing happened. Unlikely. So this is the same thing. In order to get the blockchain, and the part of the beauty of that one, that all computing the same transaction and trying to get basically the same results, mathematical results, or guess the mathematical results are more, more correctly, but I won't even go into detail over there. And basically, and if enough, if majority agree on the transaction, that's what it is. So they all have, they have to align. If somebody comes with a different result, not acceptable. You will see it disconnect. So they have to adopt. So every transaction is actually computed based on the previous transaction and so on and so on and so on. So you have a chain basically of computation that start so up to the first one. Amazing concept in that, in that context. What I also showed, there's a culture. So this is almost like saying a public ledger because everybody can see that one, right? Everybody, I mean, it doesn't matter. It's not in the bank. It's basically in the open. And people said, oh, there isn't any equivalent. And uh, coincidentally, I found there is a culture named Yap. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, a small island. You know the story? No, no you're smiling. Uh, and they have yuppies. <laughs> and yuppies are money. And what, what is those currency? What is this money? The money is actually huge stones with a hole inside that are mined in a different island. It's a very unique stone. And actually, every time that they, they mine, actually, they carry that huge thing into the island, so you think, well, wait a minute, so every time they, somebody buys something, they just actually move? No, they put the stone in the public. And how do they know who, who owns it? They don't have the writing, it's a, it was a primitive culture, so they used to tell the story from generation to the generation to generation to the generation. So they actually know who owns this stone. One of the stone actually fell to the sea while they're actually transporting it. Because it's such a property, they still refer to the stone who owns it, okay? although they don't see it. So in essence, this currency is a virtual. Okay? So we have this public ledger concept right? that actually everybody can see, but it's also connected from the history over the time. So here's the chain. But remember what I told you, suddenly we realize while well, this concept, this hammer that we had, that used to carry Bitcoin, can carry other stuff now. And what do you mean it can carry? It can reference medical records. Why not? Why it has to be Bitcoin? It must carry re records over there. It can carry, actually, ownership of a car. Why not? Or it can carry some contract between multiple entities. So what is this contract? It can carry code. A code running, it's actually, you cannot change it, they're unmutable. Because again, why it's unmutable? Because you have to do 50% of the, the community, you have to agree. But the problem actually, that, that started erasing, and we'll talk about it in a second in the next one, that everything was fine, great with the Bitcoin and the miners, and suddenly we noticed that more than 50% of the miners who actually mined those coins, are Chinese. And then I say, oh, your mind says, oh my God, something is going over here. It, it, that can be a conspiracy, right? The government can decide to do something and you have more than 50% and boom. So this is where the anxiety suddenly came around this technology and said, okay, maybe we need a different network. We can, either there's a public network, maybe a private network, something we can trust. So there's a model of trust because in the public, everybody can be a, in trade, including drug dealers, right? And <coughs> money. And think about it. Drug dealers and, and other things trading in the system, obviously they trust the system, right? To transfer, if you transfer a lot of drugs in one place to another one, obviously you're trusting it. That it will reach, that they will be paid. So there's an interesting over here is a trust and trust model. So uh, where we're heading to that one, 
uh, that we have this private blockchain and the public blockchain with the very different characteristics. Because the private, I decide who is in my network. It's almost, again, defeat the concept of distributed, equal, and all this other stuff. But that's what we actually need. It's almost telling me that in, like, Facebook, everybody's my friend. Let's be face, let, let's be true. Not everybody's my friend in, the, in my Facebook, right? I have very small community of friends. Good or bad or ugly, I know I can, can love everyone. So the same thing over here, I don't think that we will create our own network of trust network on that really address one or two particular stuff. So what we're finding out in, in general, because of no need to prove trust uh, in this network, right, then that can be actually much faster. <coughs> For us in the financial industry, just so you know, and I'll try to summarize this concept, it's still evolving. So the Ethereum, the other network that you see, it's really for, it's just as a phase because what we have actually have to get to where this, in, this technology support microtransaction. In the Bitcoin today, we actually have around 10 minutes. You know, you get a confirmation of the 10 minutes. Today with the Ethereum, for example, in the, in the private public, it's a matter of seconds. So there's a big difference, but it's still not su sufficient enough to address hundreds and thousands of transactions per second. So it's still, the technology is still evolving, but very, very powerful in this context. And this is just a picture of the uh, a digital branch, if somebody hasn't figured out that one. So I'm getting close to basically to summarize uh, my presentation. So as a, as a financial industry, as a bank, uh, that we really truly believe we, we uh, first, many flavors of technology are actually interest to us. Um, some of them I already mentioned, like blockchain, and we're actually already having some very fascinating use cases. Uh, because one of the things that uh, happening in the blockchain industry, everybody's searching for their use case, right? And I'm happy to actually to feel, I feel comfortable that we, we found the right one, and we will work on those to actually to bring them into the reality if we will succeed. But again, keep in mind, it's usually market, it, this is about marketplace. This is not something that I do for myself. I do with other. This is the one thing to remember about blockchain. Um, so cyber, clearly, all of the, the activities, uh, I have many trials, he also very much interested to us, uh, and so on. Um, I just want to talk about a little bit of the FinTech for a second, uh, for different startup. Uh, we recognize the value of the FinTech industry of all of the startup, and what in the past, we. You know, to work with us, it was used to be like uh, taking an emergency car in the middle of the rush hour and having them navigate from one end to another one between the car and begging touch to the bus. We're recognizing that that cannot work, that model, you cannot take a startup that actually is livelihood, this really depends on how fast it actually can move. And what we actually build, we're building this fast lane, the dedicated lane for them. Uh, it's uh, the ability to actually to reanalyze what are they bringing, what, what, are they have a role uh, or not. And in that context, so what we actually have done, uh, we built an entire uh, group for uh, uh, high tech that actually service those industry. So uh, <laughs> like a two years, oh, this is a year ago, more than a year ago, we looked to and, and large numbers, this is actually two years ago, numbers, large numbers of, of uh, FinTech. We, we looked at them primarily to see if this relevant technology to us. If so, we can we embed them in our system? Second, can we invest in them? And the third one, should we acquire them? So all of those options actually open for, for us, and that's what we, what we usually do. Uh, we building this, uh, here's some example of, of uh, products that we adopted and leveraged uh, already in production. Some of you might be familiar if you're from Israel. Uh, here is some of the companies that we physically invested on some money. So it's not, I, I can Im, uh, embed in some of the technology and not invest them. So all of those permutations actually are valid. Uh, we, we are the first bank that actually built APIs, and we actually continue building APIs. To re and in a, in in a very short time, suddenly we have 300 new programmers, right? 
uh, actually experimenting our system. It's not the real data, but the moment that we see the value proposition and we have agreement, we just switch it to real data, and, and they actually can run with the, the information. So they have the entire API, uh, this team actually built uh, most of it, if not all of it, uh, in, in that short time. Uh, we running usually every year uh, at bank up, uh, maybe even the year we'll do actually twice. Uh, it's almost nauseating how many bank up uh, or uh, uh, hackathon actually you hear almost every week, every month. So we're basically trying to figure out how to do something that really makes sense. Just a little bit on the fintech industry as a whole. I read an article by Preston uh, Young. Uh, and really talk about the fintech in the UK and the glamoury picture, how great it is and things like that. And then they mention Israel. Israel, oh, the another fintech is actually emerging all the startup in Israel. But I'm, when I read it, I used their own model to actually, to, to basically to say something is wrong in the model. And what I mean by that one, uh, the Israeli fintech is actually first driven by the international demand. That's, this is too small of a country to, to actually build your solution on that one. So it's really driven primarily uh, for that market. Uh, yes, the fintech industry, some of them actually come to us and actually some of them very successful. Ten, uh, I'm sorry, eight out of the ten cybersecurity companies that went public in Israel developed the product in our laboratory, which is amazing phenomena in that context, okay? And so we are really a great test bed, and we have, for example, we can run six, and Zachary Strauss will be in, in one of the panels over here. Uh, Zachary is not here. Um, he is actually on the cyber uh, laboratory. Uh, we have six to eight benchmarks that every time somebody comes, oh, well, we have a great uh, you know, solution for identifying an anomalies, okay? We'll take it against the benchmark. If we see it's better than what we have, boom, you're coming in and we'll help you actually build your product. Uh, there are, in, even in my laboratory, we actually, we took a company and we actually let them uh, develop something around uh, machine learning. We love the idea. We told them if you can solve this problem, and this problem that we raised to them, you have a business, not just with us, you probably will have a big market. They failed four times, okay? So we're willing to fail. It's not something that, and we, we were willing to get them four times after four times we stopped, okay? So it is a major investment in that context. But you're realizing that our, we as a bank, we wouldn't do these kind of things three or four years ago. Nobody would even would think. So really there is a major already transformation in terms of what we do today and what we have done in the past in that context. So back to the demand. Demand is really international driven. As, as long as the demand will be good, the FinTech industry will do, will, will do re really well. And another thing, and regulatory, and in terms of regulatory, the Israeli is actually not necessarily known for being very quick, and, and, but it's really changing. We're actually saying it. It's a double-edged sword to some extent. It's a national security also, some people are really realizing. If Citibank goes down, it's a one thing. If Bank of Poland goes down, very different story. Right? So there is some uh, rationale why it's not necessarily rushing to, to change the entire industry. From a capital, we already see some changes, okay? So we see a less and less in capital in the overall in the investment industry. Uh, but as, again, in general, if the capital will be good, investment will be good, things will be good, right? So what's really the problem? And this is the problem, skills. Scary enough to say, that almost, uh, this is something that you will be interested in. Every few months, uh, another financial industry knocked on my door and said, Yov, do you know some small company, medium company and that we can acquire? And I said, in what area? And it almost doesn't matter. They're not going for the IP. They're going for the resources, okay? So our industry, as a whole, the educational industry, I'm here with Technion, and this is a very, something we are very passionate. I don't think we can, we are not matching the demand that actually appearing. And the Shmoli Matai, the Modin, the intelligence community in the service, again, it's a, it's a really a good, good bunch of uh, uh, 
intellect that actually can exert, but the speed is actually, we are actually facing an area where less and less viable resources will be available for us internally and externally. And to the point that one time I said, we should start teach the Chinese Hebrew, okay? If we want still to be a viable FinTech industry uh, as well and bring over here. I'm saying it's a cynicism, but I think that it's already some even a sign of those that, the sign that it's actually true. So a challenge over here where we actually heading in, the, in this industry. I'm, I finished by that. Uh, I'm now give the opportunity to the next presentation to Ares and uh, Dimitri.